the years. This is a scrapbook of sound where page by page we have mounted the vivid moments of our times, engraved the living voices of our years. Trumpeter Kenneth Lanfrey, one of the surviving trumpeters of the Charge of the Light Brigade, sounds the charge as it was sounded at Balaclava the 25th of October, 1854. There's not to reason why theirs but to do and die into the valley of death road 600 I am Trumpeter Lanfrey one of the surviving trumpeters of charge of the light brigade the Balaclava I am now going to sound the bugle that was sounded at Waterloo and sound the charge as was sounded at Balaclava on that very same bugle the 25th of October, 1854. Record made at Edith House, Northumberland Avenue, London, August the 2nd, 1890. A little old lady in her 70s sits before the gaping horn of an early Edison recorder. She too recalls the bloody field of Balaclava in the Crimean War. And in a voice wrinkled with age, but rich in history, the Lady of the Lamp, the mother of modern nursing, speaks to us of a different world, a different age. The voice of Florence Nightingale. Well, I am no doubt even a family. Just the name. Just I hope my voice. I hope my voice brings to history. The great work of my the life. The great work of my life. God bless my dear old comrades. God bless my dear old comrades. A balaclava. A balaclava. And bring them. And bring them safe to shore. Safe to shore. In 1877, Edison imprisoned sound. A man with little hearing gave immortality to sound. Since then, we have preserved the words and music of an era, set them down to be heard again and again at will, summoned by the merest flick of a finger. Thomas Alva Edison speaks. When I look around at the resources of the electrical field today, I feel that I would be glad to begin again my work as an electrician and inventor, and we veterans can only urge upon our successors to realize the measure of their opportunities and to rise to the heights of their responsibilities in this day of electricity. Completely fascinated by the first machine that ever had sense enough to talk back, the great and near great sat for their portraits in sound. Naturally, one of the first to get on the bandwagon was the master showman himself, P.T. Barnum. In 1890, at the twilight of his long and colorful career, he recorded his voice for future generations, carefully squeezing in a plug for his great show as he addresses the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, Edison's phonograph. I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, Edison's phonograph, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority, C.T. Barnum. These 
these were the gay 90s, the mauve decade, the years of lace, ostrich feathers, handlebar mustaches, and bright new Indian pennies. Listen now to the voice of the gay 90s as we bridge over half a century with the timeless magic of a song. The Girl Who Threw Me Down, sung by Edward M. Favor, Edison Records. <laughs> It was in Long Island City, I got the throwdown from Kitty, she handed me my 23 out in that lonely town. If she'd accepted me, maybe, I'd not have cared for the lady, but just because she had no use for me, I wanted sweet Kitty Brown, every Sunday I go down to that old Long Island. In 1896, a silver-voiced meteor streaked out of the West to capture a political convention, a presidential nomination. Chicago, blistering hot. The shirt-sleeved delegates sit motionless, hypnotized, as William Jennings Bryan reaches the climactic finale of a history-making speech. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad, and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standards, the good thing, we will answer their demand by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And the song is the part of William Jennings Bryan. Eternally your right, Billy Boy. We are with you in the fight, Billy Boy. Cast your banners through the breeze, and we'll sweep the mighty seas, and lick the D.O.P.'s, Billy Boy. At midnight, December 31st, 1899, a new century loomed before us. What gifts would it bring? What lay ahead? Big Ben told out its advent as a steel needle etched into wax the last seconds of an old age, the first seconds of the new. Nineteen hundred in the USA. A land filled to the brim with optimism and abundance. The future gleaming as bright as a newly minted $20 gold piece. In the West, land still free for those who will work it. In the East, a turkey dinner for 25 cents. Steak, 13 cents a pound. And 75 cents would buy a matinee ticket to the New York Casino, where the hit show of the year was Floridora. Tell me, pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you? Tell of you, and love, but still girls and and tell me, pretty maiden, what this very simple girl is to do. I tell the man I want her maiden. Favorite stamping ground of the Gay Blades was the music hall. And the toast of the music hall was Lillian Russell. When She must have been very beautiful.
theater marquees took on new brilliance as Edison's incandescent light spelled out the names of a galaxy of stars. Sensation of the season of 1901 was Ethel Barrymore in Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. Years later, John Barrymore recalled, Ethel gave me my first break in the theater. She put me on the stage for the first time professionally in a play called Captain Jinx. I next played with her in a drama called Sunday, in which she spoke the now famous line, that's all there is, there isn't any more. Across the sea in far off Italy, a new star was rising. Enrico Caruso, not yet dreaming of the Met, makes his first phonograph recording. Out of the Southland came new rhythms, new tempos to set feet tapping and dancers swaying. From New Orleans came jazz, original Dixieland jazz. From Memphis came the blues. The blues is going home. The blues is a long, cool drink from a shiny tin dipper. The blues is a man wanting and a woman waiting. W.C. Handy, the father of the blues, recollects the inspiration for his immortal St. Louis blues. Our music, our blues and spirituals both come from suffering. I had the hardest time of my life in St. Louis, but it was there that I learned something that helped I heard the roustabout singing a song. It had a tonality that influenced me because there were certain tones that had never been written in music, the blue note. The prettiest woman I ever saw before or after was a woman while I was sleeping on the levees in St. Louis. That's why I wrote, St. Louis woman with her diamond rings. Pulls that man round. Because we were young, healthy and young, our leaders spoke in the idiom of youth. The buoyant and vigorous hero of young America, Teddy Roosevelt, addresses himself to his future constituents. The principles for which we stand are the principles of fair play and a square deal for every man and every woman in the United States. A square deal politically, a square deal in matters social and industrial. I wish to see you boys act as good citizens in the same way I'd expect any one of you to act in a football game. In other words, don't flinch, don't fall, and hit the line hard. Now we were cementing our geography from coast to coast and even beyond the seas. Our flag flew in the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Alaska, even on the roof of the world. An American Navy man was the first to reach the North Pole, Commander Robert E. Peary. The expedition left New York on the 6th of July, 1908, and steamed northward, arriving at Cape York, North Greenland, the 1st of August. The key of the problem was the negotiation of the 413 miles of icy chaos extending from Cape Columbia the northernmost point of all North American lands to the pole. The main party under my command, six men, five sledges, 40 dogs, pushed forward by forced marches to the pole itself while it arrived the 6th of April, 1909. Here, the stars and stripes were planted and the record left with a piece of the flag. <laughs>
By the end of the first decade of the 20th century, our states had grown to 46. We were 92 million. And of our growth, Champ Clark, member of Congress in the state of Missouri, had this to say. Mr. Speaker, I fully agree with my well-beloved friend, Mr. Mann, that the growth of this country since 1860 in wealth and in every other respect has been phenomenal. I suppose his figures are correct. But the gentleman leaves out of his calculations the most important element of growth in the United States since 1860, and that is the growth in population. And surely no Republican will dare to claim that the Republicans begat all that increase in population. Democrats did their full share in that regard. <laughs> In 1912, the country took time out for a hippodrome of democracy in action, a knockdown, drag out presidential election campaign. Defying the party bosses, hundreds of delegates to the Republican National Convention in Chicago had taken a walk and formed the Bull Moose Party. Their peerless leader, Teddy Roosevelt. Six weeks ago, here in Chicago, I spoke to the honest representatives of a convention which was not dominated by honest men. Now to you men who in your turn have come together to spend and be spent in the endless crusade against wrong. To you who face the future resolute and confident. To you who strive in a spirit of brotherhood for the betterment of our nation. To you who gird yourselves for this great new fight in the never-ending warfare for the good of humankind. I say we stand the Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. The incumbent president, William Howard Taft, gave his views on the rights of labor. In order to induce their employer into a compliance with their request for changed terms of employment, workmen have the right to strike in a body. To use such persuasion as they may, provided it does not reach the point of duress, to lead their reluctant co-laborers to join them in their union against their employer. But, President Taft continued, What they have not the right to do is to injure their employer's property, to injure their employer's business by use of threats or methods of physical duress against those who would work for him, or by carrying on what is sometimes known as a secondary boycott against his customers. If not the most popular, certainly the most persistent of all presidential candidates, was Eugene V. Debs. Mr. Eugene V. Debs, presidential candidate, Socialist Party, will now address you. Fellow workers and comrades, the socialist movement is as wide as the world, and its mission is to win the world, the whole world, and consecrate it to humanity. What a tremendous task. To realize this great social ideal is the work of education and organization. The working classes must be aroused. They must be made to hear the trumpet call of Polydam. Wednesday morning, November 6th, 1912, the country awoke to find a new kind of president had been chosen, a scholar, a former president of Princeton University. His name was Woodrow Wilson. A little of the schoolroom touch remains as Wilson, in perhaps the first fireside chat in history, speaks to the various Indian tribes at their reservations through the medium of a phonograph recording. My brother, it gives me pleasure as president of the United States to send this greeting to you. There are some dark pages in the history of the white man's dealings with the Indian, and many parts of the record are stained with the greed and avarice of those who have thought only of their own profit. But it is also true that the purposes and motives of this great government and of our nation as a whole toward the red men have been wise, just, and beneficent. The great white father now calls you his brothers, not his children. Because you have shown in your education and in your settled ways of life, staunch, manly, 
worthy qualities of sound character. Silhouettes of 1914, Tin Lizzie's, The Perils of Pauline, Buffalo Bill, The Tango and the Hesitation Waltz, Ty Cobb, Pancho Villa, Raymond Hitchcock explains the intricacies of that newfangled income tax. He is taxed an eighth of a tenth of a sixteenth of what he had before he started, take the number of the house in which he lives, add it to that. Multiply by six, divide by seven, add two, and you have the exact amount the man must pay or go to jail. A time of exuberance. Eva Tangway singing, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Panama Canal opened. George M. Cohen, the song and dance man, taking his famous curtain call. My father thanks you. My mother thanks you. My sister thanks you. That's for myself. That goes without saying. How neatly we danced our cakewalk down the smooth running stream of history. Nothing to worry about. Not a thing. Sarajevo? Never heard of the place. Franz Ferdinand? Didn't he pitch for Milwaukee a couple of seasons back? Serbia? Who cares about Serbia? Hey, let's take in the gaiety. The Wolf Hopper is doing Casey at the bat. And now the air is shattered by the fog of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. Somewhere bands are playing and somewhere hearts are light. Somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. <laughs> Like the muted mutter of distant thunder, we heard the war song. Not here, we said. Not here. We would cast up a wall about us, shut out the sounds, and sing a different song. I didn't raise my boy to be a soul. Him up to be my pride and joy. We now had things to think about at home. The Salem Fire, Mooney and Billings, our Marines at Veracruz. Proposed amendment to prohibit the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquors. The Lusitania torpedo. For a time, we hung on the lip of the whirlpool, and then we were in. Men were marching in Keokuk, Seattle, Louisville. Uncle Sammy, he gets the infantry, he gets the cavalry, he gets artillery, yes. and now, by God, we'll all go to Germany. God help Kaiserville over there. Over there, over there, the Yanks were marching over there. And to the folks back home came a message from General John J. Pershing. 3,000 miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Everything 
you hold worthwhile is at stake. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. Invoking the spirit of our forefathers, the Army asks your unflinching support to the end that the high ideals for which America stands may endure upon the earth. Farm boys and office clerks, bankers' sons and salesmen, suddenly welded into a mighty force out to salvage the world for democracy. Marshal Ferdinand Foch of France, the generalissimo of the Allied armies, pays tribute to their valor. Il ne soit permis de saluer votre drapeau. Allow me to salute your flag. Que j'ai vu flotter à côté du nôtre. Which I saw waving side by side with our own. Et emporté. Par des armes ardentes, which I saw carried by ardent souls, on des bons victorieux de la Marne, victorious thrust from the Marne, de la Meuse et de la Moselle, the Meuse and the Moselle, jusqu'au rive du Rhin, up to the banks of the Rhine. On the Eastern Front, in Russia, Tsarist resistance collapses and the Bolsheviks seize power. Listen to the voice of Lenin. <laughs> Comrades, the capitalists are waging war against Russia. They are sending money and military supplies to the Russian landowners, hoping to restore the power of the Tsar, the power of the landowners, the power of the capitalists. No, that shall never be. Peace came at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Wilson, flushed with victory, intense with idealism, went to Europe to battle for his dream, a League of Nations. But the time was not yet. In the United States Senate, Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts spoke the gospel of isolationism. You may call me selfish if you will, conservative or reactionary, or use any other harsh adjective you see fit to apply. But an American I was born, an American I have remained all my life. I have never had but one allegiance. I cannot divide it now. I have loved but one flag, and I cannot share that devotion and give affection to the mongrel banner invented for a league. Internationalism, illustrated by the Bolsheviks, is to me repulsive. There were those who saw in an international federation a promise of perpetual peace. Madame Ernestine schumann heink not as a singer, but as an anguished mother who saw her sons fight with opposing armies, reduces all arguments to a simple common denominator. What I have learned is this, that the problems of one set of people are the problems of all. And the things that make men alike are finer and stronger than the things which make them different. Ah, yeah, so much I have learned. Ah, yeah, what a truly great woman. And now she sings. But the war was over, and in 1920, there was much activity here at home. Another presidential election, only now something new has been added. The women have got themselves the vote. Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt. It took George Washington six years to rectify men's grievances by war, but it took 72 years to establish women's rights by law. At least 1,000 legal enactments were necessary, 
and every one was a struggle against ignorant opposition. Woman suffrage is a long story of hard work and heartache. The election of 1920 saw the ladies, old hands at making themselves heard, elbowing their better halves right off the election stump. Here's Corrine Roosevelt Robinson, sister of Teddy Roosevelt. I am one who believes that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have different ideas. The Republican Party is the party of concrete nationalism as opposed to the hazy internationalism of the Democratic Party. Let us strive with might and main to put our beloved country in the safekeeping of Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. A country weary of war agreed. Harding and Coolidge were elected. But even then, many of the leaders of both parties looked into the future and saw world peace through world cooperation. In 1921, President Harding called for a conference to meet in Washington to plan for world disarmament. Gentlemen of the conference, the United States welcomes you with unselfish hands. We harbor no fears. We have no sordid ends to serve. We suspect no enemy. We contemplate or apprehend no conquest. Content with what we have, we seek nothing which is another's. I can speak officially only for our United States. Our hundred million, frankly, want less of armament and none of war. The people watching the game of international chess in Washington saw us trade battleships for promises. Will Rogers had a plan. I got a plan that'll stop all wars. When you can't agree with your neighbor, you move away. Or with your wife, she either shoots you or moves away from you. Now that's my plan. Move nations away from each other. Take France, Germany. They can't agree. I'll take France and trade places with Japan. Let Japan live there by Germany. And if those two want to fight, well, let them fight. Who cares? We'd run excursions to war like that. Stunned, dazed, sick at heart, Wilson saw his great dream collapse. On his deathbed from his residence in Washington, November 10th, 1923, Wilson issued one last call for America to assume leadership in the struggle for everlasting peace. Do you remember the strong voice of the Wilson of 1914? It gives me pleasure as President of the United States to send this greeting to you. Here is the same voice nine years later. This was to always be a source of deep mortification to us. That we shall inevitably be forced. And we shall inevitably be forced. By the moral obligations of freedom and of honor. moral obligations of freedom and honor. To retrieve that fatal error. Retrieve that fatal and assume once more, and assume once more the role of courage, self-respect, and helpfulness. The role of courage, self-respect, and helpfulness, which every true American must wish to believe be the true part, our true part in the affairs of the Now the golden years of the 1920s really blossomed. A lush, loud, luxuriant era. This was normalcy. Hot dog. We have no bananas. We have no bananas today. (laughs) Silhouettes of the 1920s. Bobbed hair, short skirts, prohibition. The saloon bows out and the speakeasy bows in. Evangelist Billy Sunday strikes a blow at demon rum. I don't give a hoot whether a man guzzles beer standing at the bar or whether sitting down at a table. Booze sold to a preacher or a high school girl has the same effect as when it's sold to an automobile thief or a horse thief. Oh, America needed repentance. She didn't need rum. She needed righteousness. 
We don't need Jags. We need Jesus. We don't need more grog. We need more of God. Wow. <laughs> we certainly did, brother. Hollywood extravaganzas. Douglas Fairbanks, Sr.? That divine hair. And those two lovely stars. Just a little fright. I love you, darling. Will you come to my estate? And I don't want to be anything but your husband. Well, Big Fair was just around the corner. Flappers from coast to coast sought solace in the chic as Rudolph Valentino stalked the silent screen. George Gershwin caught the rhythm of the era and transcribed the fingerprint of the 20s into music. At the New Amsterdam Theater, Flo Ziegfeld glorified the American girl. In the Follies, Cantor, Jolson, Jessel, and the rollicking W.C. Fields. Might have slipped on that drum, pardon me. I'm on for that. <laughs> Hurry, huh? I'll kill you. Let me through. I'll... <laughs> Didn't recognize me at first. I'll attend to this in the flash. I'll, <laughs> I'll take care of it immediately. Has anybody was swallow with brandy? It was a time of fads, froth, and fiesta. Crossword puzzles, Marjan, Emil Kuey. Day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. A people bred on Longfellow, Bryant, and Poe suddenly found themselves reading Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and James Joyce. Modernism, they called it. And Gertrude Stein was its patron saint. Yes, a very valentine. Very fine is my valentine, very fine and very mine. Very mine is my valentine, very mine and very fine. Very fine is my valentine and mine. Very fine, very mine and mine is my valentine. Yellow slickers, raccoon coats, pennants and chrysanthemums. Sports is suddenly big business. Concrete stadiums, million dollar gates. Giants arise, Bobby Jones. You rather put me off my game. <laughs> But I've never been so impressed by anything in my life as the way you, you've turned out today. Jack Dempsey. Of course, everything's a fight right now, and I've got to keep fighting. Newt Rockney. I don't want spring football unless you do. Now, uh, all those in favor of coming out for spring football, those who insist on having football, insist on having Hunk and Shav and Vadish and I uh, take charge of the spring, will all signify by saying aye. <laughs> Gertrude Ederly, Charlie Paddock, Helen Wills. Babe Ruth. And I remember going way back years ago, which is a long time, I had a lot of fun out of it. I appreciate all my punishments and all my recreations and everything that I had out of baseball. And I want to say one thing for the paper reporters. They've banged me, they've banged me, they've kicked me, and they've given me praise. But as someone said to me years ago, Says, babe, if they spell your name right, never regret it. Big as we were, and bigness was our trademark, we could be wildly sentimental over a hero. A slim young man in a silver monoplane winged across the Atlantic, and the nation held its breath. Then the news flash. Lindbergh in Paris! Pandemonium in Paducah, hysteria in Hagerstown, as the Lone Eagle comes home. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, this is Graham McNamee speaking from the Navy Yard, Washington, D.C. Just a moment ago, the last turn of the propellers of the Memphis brought her close into the dock. The entire white uniformed crew of the Memphis is now lined up at attention along the side nearest the dock awaiting Lindbergh. Lindbergh is coming down the gang plant. Here's the boy. He's come forward. Unassuming, quiet, a little droop to his shoulders. He's tired out. Very serious and awfully nice. And later, Lindy speaks for himself. 
want to express my appreciation of the reception I've had in America. When I landed at the Bourget a few weeks ago, I landed with the expectancy and the hope of being able to see Europe. It was the first time I had ever been abroad. I had already been gone from America for two days, a little less. And I wasn't in any hurry to get back. <laughs> I found that it didn't make much difference whether I wanted to stay over there or not. And I was informed that while it wasn't in order to come back home, <laughs> that there'd be a battleship waiting for me the next week. Politically, we put together a patchwork of personalities. The people's choice ranged the gamut from the Baron to the Bazaar. From Calvin Coolidge... I believe in the American Constitution. I favor the American system of individual enterprise, and I am opposed to any general extension of government ownership and control. To Jimmy Walker... The confidence that you have manifested in me tonight will be justified. If there were a scintilla of doubt, in my mind, or yet in my heart, about the honesty, about the purpose, about the truthfulness, and about the affection that went with it. If there was any doubt in my mind of my public official record as the mayor of this city, I would never have accepted your invitation and would never have imposed but who had time for politics? And who cares? We were watching a three-ring circus, munching cotton candy, swigging down bathtub lemonade, and having a whale of a time. Feature attractions? Florida real estate, booming stock market prices, sleek new automobiles, Amy Semple McPherson. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, come, come. Like chiming bells at evening tide, this word rings out all through the Bible. Come. In Genesis, come. In Matthew, come. Clear through to the Revelation. You can talk about to me. You can talk about me. Just as much as you please. Just as much as you please. I'll talk about to you. I'll talk about you. Down on my knee. Down on my knee. You can talk about me. Just as much as you please. I'll talk about you. Down on my knee. Ain't I going to agree? I ain't going to agree. My Lord anymore. But star billing in the big top of the 20s went to prohibition, the noble experiment. We swayed dizzily to the pros and the cons. Said the pros... It was the aspiration on the part of the American people to protect and to conserve human life and human values that wrote prohibition into the American Constitution. That same aspiration will keep prohibition in the Constitution as long as that document shall survive said the cons. Has it stopped draft? No. We must repeal the 18th Amendment and we will. Said the pros. We call attention to the fact that women are not suffering from the blows of drunken husbands as in the days when the saloon had right of way. Said the cons through one of their most volatile spokesmen, Congressman Fiorella H. LaGuardia, I believe that God Almighty, when he made grapes, intended that grapes should be enjoyed by all of the people. And I don't think that he intended the use of grapes to be made into jelly. Prohibition would be a success when Congress, by an act of, or by a law, will be able to stop fermentation or to repeal the law of gravitation.
And yet, deep below, an undercurrent was always present. In the midst of prosperity, peroxide, and pageant, there were signs, foreboding signs. In Germany, the war-born Weimar Republic tottered on the brink of economic disaster as Hitler Youth sang its ominous ode. <laughs> To stave off catastrophe in Europe, President Herbert Hoover called a moratorium on the payment of war debts. While the plan is particularly aimed to economic relief, yet the economic relief means the swinging of men's minds from fear to confidence, the swinging of nations from the apprehension of disorder and of governmental collapse toward hope and confidence in the future. But hope seemed far beyond the horizon. The world was caught up by fear. We watched the good old days drain away in a cascade of stock market quotations. Desperately, we repeated the old formula, not here, not here. Fascism in Germany and Italy, blood purges in Russia, violence in India. From the other side of the world, a wizened, half-naked little man is led to prison, Mahatma Gandhi. I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I know the value of discipline and truth. I must ask you to believe me when I say that I have never made a statement of this description that the masses of India, if it became necessary, would resort to violence. I regard myself as incapable in my lucid moments of, having, uh, of making a statement of this character. Despite this protest, Gandhi is imprisoned and all India cries out in anguish. What greater tribute could be given to Gandhi than that expressed by Dr. Albert Einstein? I believe that Gandhi's views were the most enlightened of all the political men in our time. We should strive to do things in his spirit, not to use violence in fighting for our cause, but by non-participation in anything you believe is evil. Suddenly, it was here, here at our own doorstep, depression, apple sellers at the corner, bread lines twisting along Main Street. From across the water came the voice of George Bernard Shaw. You are president who became famous by feeding the starving millions of war-devastated Europe, cannot feed his own people in time of peace. Our statesmen on both sides can do nothing but buy them off with doles and appeals to charity. This then was a curtain, a finale of sorts, and yet in no sense was this an ending. It was merely the closing of a chapter. We had taken on the responsibilities of adulthood. Another Roosevelt was in the White House. I believe with Abraham Lincoln that the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or cannot do so well for themselves in their separate and in their individual capacities. My friends, I still believe in ideals. My friends, we still believe in ideals. And by the light of these ideals, we face the future. On the road ahead, we may well look back and remember. Remember the days of our youth and of our growth. To you, you who stand on the threshold of tomorrow, 
hark the years.